All right. So Victor had a question about a couple of um, the oh. problems from chapter 13. So I'm going to um, pull that up on my computer. I'm going to share my screen. And that way you guys can see it as well. So share screen. Okay, so in a minute, you should be able to see the screen. Yep, okay, good. Um, so here we are in chapter 13. But let's go find number 61. There it is. All right, so 61. How far from the center of the sun would the net gravitational force of Earth and the sun on a spaceship be zero? All right, so the idea with this one is, so we're somewhere between the Earth and the Sun, and at that point, the, the tug towards the Earth is equal to the tug towards the Sun. All right, so basically, um, there's that tug of war between those two masses, and at that point, it's dead even. So if we're right there, we're not going to fall towards the Sun or towards the Earth. It's where they're putting the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and that is exact, exactly right, right? Because if we can put it there, it's just going to want to sit. Um, obviously, there are going to have to be minor adjustments to deal with gravity due to, uh, you know, Jupiter and Mercury and everything else. But um, for the most part, yeah, we're just looking at where that balances out. All right, so let's see if we can figure that out. Uh, so let's go to the board. And let's just look at the forces that are applying. So here's our spacecraft. So our little UFO spacecraft that's somewhere between the sun and the earth. And because we are like this, because we're Americans, we'll make this uh, the North American view. All right, so there's the Earth. So we want this spot so that we've got a force that's pulling us due to Earth. So I'm going to call this G sub E. I'm going to have G sub S. And we want those guys equal. All right, so let's think about how we calculate these forces. If we go to that for the sun, we're going to have that force is equal to G times our mass, let's just say that we're mass m, times the mass of the sun, divided by, and let's call this guy x for that distance, so our distance from the center of the sun, because that's what we were being asked, right, is how far from the center of the sun, so let's call that x. So once we solve our equation, if we get it as x equals, that's our Okay, so there's the force due to gravity of the sun. So let's do the same thing with the earth. So we're gonna have our gravitational constant, the same mass of us, but now this is times the mass of the earth. And then we need another distance. We need this distance right here. And what I'm gonna call that, I'm gonna call that r minus x. So that makes this distance r. So big R is going to be the distance from the center of the sun to the center of the earth. All right, so, so far so good? We like that? All right, I'm getting thumbs up, cool. So interestingly enough, Turns out it doesn't matter how massive our object is, it's only going to be that location because that mass is going to cancel out, as does the big G. So we're going to get ms times r minus x squared equals me times x squared. And that's a quadratic equation. 
that we're going to be able to solve it once we put in our numbers. All right, so let me go to my trusty physics book here that's got all these numbers for us. All right, so the mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. That R, well, that's the orbit radius of the Earth, which is right around 93 million miles in meters. It is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. Now, here's where we got to be a little bit careful. The orbital radius, it's a question of where is that actually measured? Is it from the center of the sun? Is it from the surface of the sun? Is it to the center of mass of the Earth? Is it to the edge of the Earth? Right. So really, like worst case scenario is we're off by the radii of the sun and the Earth. But the Earth, its radius is on the order of 10 to the 6th meters. And 10 to the 6th compared to 10 to the 11th, we don't care. So that one we can completely ignore. Um, the sun, it's on the order of 10 to the 8th, which again, probably not concerned about because that's three decimal places in. So I think we're probably fine just to go with the 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. I don't think it would really change things if much if we went to 1.503 or something like that. All right, so that's R. And then the mass of the Earth. Let's see, its mass, 6 point, or no, I lied. It is 5.97 times 10 to the 24. So there's the equation that we need to solve for x. So I'm going to go ahead and just try and put that into my T89. I've never tried to do a solve an equation with um, this large of a number before, but what the hell, let's see. So we're going to go ahead and solve 1.99 E30 times 1.5 E11 minus X, that quantity squared, equals 5. 0.97 e24 times x squared okay so i get two numbers which again shouldn't surprise us since it is a quadratic right we're going to get the plus or the minus so the first one is 1 1.5 times 10 to the 11 and the other one is 1.5 times 10 to the huh, 11. Interesting. Okay, because they're, they're not quite both the same. One is 150, the other is 149. Uh, let me change these. So let's go 1.49 times 10 to the 11th. And then the other one was 1.50. Super close. Well, with that magnitude, it's a little bit different. Well, they're off by 10 to the ninth meters, which yeah. is fairly significant. 
right? 10 to the ninth meters, that's a million kilometers. I don't know about you, but a million kilometers is pretty significant. All right, so which one of these is the actual value for X? Which one are we looking for? The one closer to the sun? Yeah. So it's going to be this one. Yeah. Because it's pulling. But check that out. <coughs> it's not, I mean, it's not close to the sun at all. If this were, like, if this were to scale, it would be virtually on the Earth. Right? I mean, it, it would look like it's at the Earth. Does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Yeah, why? The sun's gravity is just gnarly compared to that of the Earth. Right, because of this mass. I mean, look at the mass difference. It's 10 to the 6. It's a million times more massive than the Earth. So that means the distance to the sun needs to be not a millionth, but we have to square to be proportional, right? But if these are proportional, you multiply by the MS by a million, you have to have a corresponding multiplication to this X of a thousand. So it drastically changes that R, right? And it is just because of that huge mass difference in the sun, between the sun and the earth. Anyway, so that's what my calculator says, assuming I punched everything incorrectly um, as my solution, but it seems reasonable to me that it should be way closer to the earth than it is to the sun. Anyway, so good for number 61. All right, getting some thumbs up, awesome. All right, so let's go look at number 71. So I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, so 71. We've got a satellite of mass 1,000 kilograms in a circular orbit about the Earth. The radius of the orbit of the satellite is equal to two times the radius of Earth. How far away is the satellite? And then find the kinetic potential and total energies of the satellite. Okay, so let me write this stuff down again. We got a mass of a thousand kilograms. And we got the radius of orbit is twice the radius of Earth. All right, so we wanna figure out how far away it is and then kinetic potential and total energies. All right, let's go back to the whiteboard. Okay, so we've got a mass of a thousand kilograms and there's the radius of our orbit. All right, so again, the radius of the Earth is 6.38 times 10 to the sixth meters. So 6.4 million meters. So that means that our R is double this. Um, seven, six. So that means that the distance from the center of the Earth to where our satellite is, is 1.276 times 10 to the seventh meters. So almost 13 
million meters. All right, so in terms of where is the satellite? Well, there's the answer. It's 6,000 some kilometers from the surface of the Earth. All right, so, so far so good. All right, so now let's get energies. Let's start potential. All right, so how do we actually calculate the potential energy? Because we can't just use MGH anymore. So what did we see last time? How do we calculate gravitational potential energy? All right, so Victor gives us it's the negative G times m1, m2 divided by r. So there, the m1 and the m2, well, the 1m is the mass of um, the satellite, so that's our 1,000 kilograms, and then the other mass is the mass of the Earth. So let's just write it this way. It's going to be minus G M E times M. So we'll worry about putting those guys in in a second. And then divided by R. So that's this right here. Why is it not R squared again? Because it came from integrating. The R squared was the force. But when we went to calculate the potential energy, it was the work done by the force. So we had to integrate. And when you integrate an over R squared, you get an over R. Okay. You go from R to the minus two to R to the minus one. Yep. Okay, so there's our potential energy. And I know it feels weird because we got the negative number here, but that's how we're going to define this so that we get zero potential energy when we're infinitely far away and it gets more negative as we get closer. But it doesn't matter, right? We, when we set up our potential energy before, it was just a question of setting a place for zero. We just happen to choose infinity for zero. All right, so potential energy, piece of cake. So let's go to kinetic energy. So for the kinetic, we need one half mv squared. So we've got the mass, no problem. But we got to figure out the v. All right, so how do we figure out how fast this thing's going? Okay, so Victor just said it's rotating, so we can use the V and R omega stuff. And we definitely can, but that would require us to know how quickly it's rotating. And that we don't know, right? Nothing tells us how fast this is going around. Um, it'd be different if they told us it was like in a geosynchronous orbit. Geosynchronous just means that it stays above the same point on Earth the entire time. Then we would know that its omega is also 24 hours, or 2 pi over 24, I mean. So, um, but unfortunately, we don't know that this is geosynchronous. So that's not going to work for us. Any other ideas? All right, so Victor gives us conservation of energy. Another great idea. We would need to somehow know then the total energy at a different place. 
and I don't think they gave us that information, right? And it's not like we could say, well, let's just bring this back to Earth, the surface of the Earth, and calculate its kinetic and potential energies. Um, because there was work done to get it where it is. So we'd have to add that in, and we don't know that. OK, so the question is, can we calculate the speed of the orbit? And that we absolutely can do. We're going to have to make use of something that we've used a few times now with stuff going in circles. And that's the centripetal acceleration. So does anybody remember the centripetal acceleration? What the formula is? And theta over time. No, that's the angular acceleration. It's V squared over R. If you go back and you look, we've seen this a few times. Get that into your head. That's a, that's a huge one. That when you've got something going in circular motion, the velocity is related to the centri uh, centripetal acceleration by that formula. So you at least remember seeing that. I hope. Yeah. OK. So here's how we can play this out then. So think about what's causing that centripetal acceleration. What force is making that happen for the satellite? Gravity. That's gravity. So what we know is that the force due to gravity, that's going to equal the mass times this acceleration. So this is just Newton's second law, F equals MA, just the force is the gravitational force. So think about that gravitational force, that's G times ME times M over big R squared. So uh, actually, no, 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 hold on, same R. It's the distance away that we are, so that equals mv squared over r. So the m's cancel, but one of the r's cancels. So we get v is equal to the square root of g times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius, so the distance away that we happen to be. So that's how fast that satellite's going. It depends upon your radius, how far away you are. So if we move closer to the Earth, we get larger velocity. The further away we are, the slower we're going to go due to the gravity. Well, now I can take that V and I can put that in here. So I'm going to get 1 half M G M E over R. Let me actually just put that one half here with two R on the bottom. But it's beautiful. I'm squaring the square root. But that's going to be my kinetic energy. And again, we have all these numbers. We know the mass of our object. We know the gravitational constant of the world, of the universe. We know the mass of the Earth. And we know how far away we are. That's that R. So then if we want to go to the total energy, that, of course, is going to be the U plus K. So I'll call this E sub T for total energy. Um, you can add those together. And if you get a common denominator, it's kind of nice. They just. Uh, all you got to do is multiply this first one by 2. But what you end up with is negative g times m times me over 2r. So the total energy is actually the same magnitude as the kinetic energy. 
you just make it negative. So that's kind of cool. So I think at this point, I'm going to stop because now it's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. And you should be able to find the mass of the Earth somewhere. That's wild. Nice. Yep, it is. It's kind of cool how it all plays out. But this is only when it's a circular orbit. If it's elliptical, this isn't the case anymore. Elliptical orbits are a little bit more difficult to deal with because your R's are changing, which means your velocities are changing and all that. Really what it comes down to is that it's not your velocity is changing. It just, it's not bound by this A equals V squared over R anymore because not all of your acceleration is centripetal pointing. But anyway, is that better for 71? Nope, getting some thumbs up, awesome. All right, anything else? Okay, well, I just wanna share one more thing about gravity before we switch our gears to fluids. So we've now seen how to accurately represent gravity, that it's not constant, that it does change. It depends on where we are. We've seen that we have to redefine our potential energy, but that's, it's okay. It still works. The new way that we've defined it still holds with the um, small distance assumptions that we've done before. So it, everything's in line. Um, when things are in orbit, like we just did here, if they're circular, orbits, we know that gravity is what's causing the centripetal acceleration, and so then we can do things like calculate velocity and kinetic energies. So um, the one other thing I wanted to mention about this is that, um, like I was saying, it's a lot harder when it's not a circular orbit, and what we do know is that orbits are always elliptical. And don't forget that a circle is an ellipse, it's just it's a special form. But orbits do have to be elliptical, and this is one of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So Kepler took what um, Newton came up with with this idea of gravitation and decided to apply it to orbiting bodies. And what he found, he actually created three laws. Um, I know that they're in the book. I don't really want to talk about them um, in terms of their derivation and all that, but you guys have the math to do it. In fact, um, well, uh, maybe not quite. I, I know that often in vector calc, we have people prove them, prove Newton or uh, Kepler's laws. Um, it looks like I'll probably be your vector calc teacher, at least as of right now, that's the plan. Um, <laughs> but things of course are changing daily as we know. Um, but I imagine we'll probably revisit Kepler's laws and, and maybe do the proofs there. But so I'm just gonna tell you what they are right now. Um, the first is that all orbiting bodies orbit in an elliptical path. Okay, so um, this is something that you were probably introduced to back in pre-calculus. Again, it's another thing I know I share with my 103B students as a why we care about these shapes kind of thing when you're talking about conic sections. Um, but it is kind of cool that we actually do follow an elliptical path um, but the center of mass of the sun is actually located at one of the foci. So that's one of Kepler's laws. And um, you can actually, like I said, you can prove it pretty easily with um, vector calculus. All right, so that was the first one. Um, the other two talk about how you travel in an elliptical path. So um, a second one of them is that if you were to look at the time that it takes to go over a certain amount of distance on your elliptical path, it's equal for every same rotation of theta. So let me show you what I mean by that on the whiteboard. 
So let me draw an ellipse. And to make this interesting, we're going to make it one that's got a high eccentricity. So it's more cigar, cigar shape than circle shape. So here's an ellipse. And we're going to have the sun at one of the foci. So this is probably more appropriate for like a comet than a planet, because the planets aren't going to have this elliptical uh, elliptical of a path. Um, so, but but let's just say that this is a planet or a, a comet or something. Okay. So what um, Kepler's law says here is that if you were to look at this area, let's call this area one, and then you were to look at, say, this area, area two, this second law says that if a1 equals a2, so that's what I was getting at as you're sweeping through the same amount, so if a1 equals a2, so if those areas are the same, then the time needed to travel the same, or the arc lengths of those are equal. So in this picture, ooh, I brought out some, I found some color whiteboard pens. Let me know if they actually show up as colors. So I'm gonna go purple. So if you were to look at this distance right here, does that look purple? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure, not but yet. ever so slightly. No, that's okay. That's okay. I'm just curious. I'll, I'll try red next. How's red turn out? Looks like red. Okay, cool. We'll try. We'll try to color up our experience here a bit. I I think I'm just colorblind. <laughs> All right. So if we look at those two arc lengths, what Kepler's Kepler's second law says is that the amount of time it takes to travel on those two arcs is equal if those areas are the same. So. Um, what you'll often see is it'll say something like it, it sweeps out the same area in the same amount of time or something like that. But in an applied situation or what this means in the actual universe is that if we've got a comet that comes up close to the sun, it moves much faster when it's near the sun and it slows down when it's further away. So this is why, like, you've probably heard of Halley's Comet. It's one of the most famous ones in the world. And it shows up, I think, every 76 years. But we only end up seeing it for, like, a month. That means that its orbit is really kind of elliptical. So you can think about, like, the entirety of its orbit takes 76 years. But the portion down here by the sun where we can see it is only a couple months because it's moving so much faster when it's closer to the sun. And this is why when um, like NASA or other space agencies launch stuff, they bank it off of the sun to give it more velocity. Yep. Yeah, and, and it can be not just the sun, right, but other planets and things like that. Yeah, they call it the slingshot. And that's exactly it. They use the gravity of another object to kind of speed it up. So we've got this probe, let's say, that we're sending towards Jupiter, but we do a flyby of Venus. So it's approaching Venus. It then gets sped up and then launches this way with greater velocity. And eventually we'll end up running into, let's say, Jupiter, right? So that's one of those weird things where we may be aiming for a spot over here, but we actually launch it to a spot over there making use of that sling, slingshot effect. Okay, so that's uh, Kepler's second law. 
And then the third law is, um, was actually the hardest one for him to prove. It took him like a super, super long time to prove this one. But what it says is that the period of the orbit It's actually proportional to the three halves power, so the three halves power of the length of the major axis. That must have been a lot of observation. Yeah. It, I mean, it actually spills out mathematically, but uh, yeah, it's definitely not obvious. So do you remember what the major axis is of an ellipse, what that means? Uh, isn't that like the longest between like distance? Yeah, it's the longest way across the ellipse. So let me kind of reproduce our ellipse down here with less stuff in it. The major axis length is that. So the focus is somewhere on that line, but it goes, it's the long way across. And so what this says in a formula is that T is equal to K times L to the three halves. So the bigger the axis, the longer the time, which should make sense, right? If we've got a longer axis, it's going to take longer for us to go around. Um, but it is interesting that it's actually the three halves power. It, it seems weird, but uh, that is what it is. So you can actually calculate that K and what it's made up of, it depends upon the gravitational constant, which I'm sure doesn't surprise you, but it also depends upon the mass of the object that we're orbiting. So like if we're gonna talk about a comet going around the sun, we'd use the mass of the sun. Um, and then it's got, well, it's got a square root and then there's a factor of two pi that comes from just rotational quantities. Um, but again, you can derive that as well. So like I said, I'm not gonna actually calculate or prove these things for you. I just wanted to tell you that they do exist and they are derived from the law of gravity. So basically, if you just approach this from a, let's take the force due to gravity, let's break into its components that are centripetal versus not and blah, 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 these things fall out. So. Um, I mean, it took a while, obviously, for these to come about, um, but we know that they definitely work. And uh, yeah, there you go. So anyway, are you guys excited for when Holly's Comet comes again? No. No? <laughs> Comets freak me out. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, com Comets are pretty damn cool. Um, I did see Halley's Comet. It came about, I think it was 1986. If it wasn't 80, it was 85 or 87. It was, it was right around there. I want to say it was like at the end of my middle school, start of high school experience. Um, and I did see it. It was really underwhelming, you know, for something that's so famous. It was really kind of blah. Uh, there have been way cooler comets um, since then. Um, but I am one of those people that might get to see it twice in their lifetimes. I'm definitely set up for it because I was like 13, 14, something like that when it first came, which, you know, add 76, no, that puts me at about 90. So, um, I got a chance and, uh, and I figure as long as I keep drinking really high quality root beers, that's going to extend my life. It's when I go to that, you know nasty weak stuff that uh, i'm gonna have to worry about it so when is anyway. it happening again <laughs> say again when when is it happening again uh it so it was i think it was 1986 
So add 76 years to that. So that should be what, 2062, I think. Wow. So set your calendars. We only got like 42 more years. So um, yeah, you guys should be good for, for the next time it comes around. In between that time, do you think there will be other comets that are- Oh, absolutely. No. <laughs> no, the, the, the comets come by all the time. Um, yeah. They're not always visible and they're not always like super, super bright, but um, there was one in probably around 95, it was somewhere in that like 94, 95, 96 time. Um, and that one was like, I think it was called Hirataki. That was crazy bright, like covered up a huge part of the sky. Um, if you've heard of Heaven's Gate, it was a, a cult down in LA. It was a bunch of people that, um, it was kind of like a Jonestown thing, you know, drinking of the Kool-Aid where um, they, they all committed mass suicide because their leader, I'm trying to remember his name, it'll come to me, I'm sure later, um, was convinced that there was an alien spacecraft in the comet. And when they killed themselves, then they would get transported up to um, the alien craft. So they ended up, um, they found all their bodies like in very clean um, white clothes with brand new tennis shoes and all this. It was a thing. But um, so comets come all the time. And um, I guarantee you that before Halley's Comet comes back, there will be other ones that are visible. It's just the thing about comets. So here we go off on another sidetrack, but just, just kind of. Um, not all comets follow parabolic paths or I mean, uh, elliptical paths. Um, some of them follow parabolic paths and some of them follow hyperbolic paths. It all depends on the speed that they have um, when they come in contact with the gravitational field. Um, you have to have just the right speed to get caught and go in an ellipse. And so comets are formed um, out in, well, there's an area called the Oort cloud, it's O-R-T. Oort cloud that's really like just a bunch of ice dust chunks and stuff like that that's out past Pluto um, and a lot of them are formed there they end up colliding and they get uh, pushed in towards the center of the you know, solar system and um, so they'll start moving towards the center of the earth and then or sorry center of the solar system and then depending upon their speed sometimes they'll get caught in elliptical paths like Halley's Comet um, but other times they're on hyperbolas or parabolas. And the problem with those is they don't come back. So you can't predict when you're going to see them. You just now all of a sudden, oh, look, there's one. And you see it for a while and then it disappears. And that's what happened with like that one, the, the Hirataki or whatever it was. Um, so it's only the elliptical ones that we can predict. And in order to predict those, they have to have been around um, long enough with a short enough period that they could have been they could have been measured frequently enough. And and that's the thing about Halley's comet is that uh, it's I mean you think about it its period is seventy six years. Even if you just go with like the history of the United States, right? You just look at how young we are as a country. It's shown up like three times just since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Right. And so if you just go to written history, it's shown up a bunch of times. And so we can get good predictions. Um, it's the ones that are not elliptical that are going to be the ones that just pop up that all of a sudden we go, oh, my God, hey, look, there's a crazy comet. So, That's cool. Yeah. So anyway, uh, and you can like there are sites that keep you up to date on this sort of stuff. Um, I, one of the places I go to, it's called Heavens Above, and it's a, uh, it gives you really good information on what's visible in the sky. Um, it also gives you really good information on satellite passes. So um, if you ever want to know like when you're going to be able to step outside and see the International Space Station, it'll give you predictions for your location. Um, but it will mention comets as well. Most of them are not visible to the naked eye. Um, but those that, uh, but even if they're not, you could still take telescopes out if you know where you're looking um, and, and point them at them. So there are places that will let you know. I will keep my eyes open if anything's coming about 
um, since it sounds like you guys as a group are kind of interested in um, astronomy and, and cosmology and stuff. If anything funky is going on, I'll be sure to let you know. I do know that kind of in the middle of May, I'll, I'll find a specific date, uh, there's going to be a time where the crescent moon is going to be super close to both Venus and Jupiter. So they're, they're all going to um, kind of come together. And what's going to be kind of cool about it is it's going to make a smiley face. Oh, where that's cool. The two planets are going to look like the eyes. And then the yeah. crescent moon is going to look like the, the smile. So I'll, uh, that's definitely one that I'm planning on trying to go out and, and get a picture, um, see if we can use my son's telescope to get, he gets pretty decent pictures actually when he uses his telescope and his cell phone. Um, let's see if we can get some decent shots of that, but I'll let you know. Um, yeah, I definitely want to see that. So, uh, and I'll let you know, like there was also a big meteor shower not that long ago. I think it was the Leonids were just a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'll try to keep you guys posted when I find out about fun things going on. All right. Hey, let's take a break. I need to go uh, use the facilities as they say. So I'm going to pause the recording. All right. So um, we're going to move now into the next chapter. I think it's chapter number 14, which is about fluids. So we're going to spend the rest of today talking a little bit about fluids and how fluids work and, and the physics of them. Um, and uh, like you guys know, this is a little bit near and dear to my heart because the physics I did um, and that I studied was fluid physics. Um, but I'm going to give you kind of just the brief overview. Obviously, this isn't a class on fluid dynamics. You can um, take plenty of those later. But we'll give you just sort of the this is how fluids work. This is what's going on. Um, so you can get a feel for um, how they behave and how things are a little bit different when we're dealing with them. So first thing is first, we need to get to what are fluids. Now, this is one of those things that we often think we know what fluids are, but we aren't quite right because fluids, according to the physics world, are not exactly what fluids are in the real world. So out there, you go ask somebody what a fluid is, they're probably going to say a liquid, right? And that is true. Liquids are fluids, but there are other things that are fluids too. So you know about the different states of matter. You know about solids and liquids and gases, right? And, and the fourth one, I guess, the plasmas. But you know about those. So fluids, um, fluids are things whose shape can change. What we like to say is that, um, or a good, I, I guess this would be for a uh, non-physicist, the way that you would say it, um, just for the common person, is you'd say that a fluid is something that can take the shape of its container, right? So you think about when you have water in a glass, your glass can have weird shapes and water will fill the entirety of the glass, whether it's, you know, like a mug versus a bottle, right? Versus whatever. It's just going to end up taking the shape of that container. So liquids do that, but so do gases, right? If you think about like a balloon, the gas inside of a balloon ends up taking the shape of the balloon or take this mug again, right? So I fill this glass or this mug with water. It's going to take the shape. Well, I can also fill this with air. And in fact, right now it is. I know it looks empty, but there's a lot of air in it. But that air is evenly distributed. It's taken on the shape of this container. Okay, so that's the best way to think about a fluid. A fluid is something that will take the shape of the container. Now, solids don't, right? You think about solid. I go and I take a solid and I put it in here, say my whiteboard pen. It doesn't fill up the entirety of the mug. It keeps its shape and just stays there. All right, so that's a good way to think of the difference between them. Now, you do have to be a little bit careful because like, what if I took sand and I put sand in this? Now, you can maybe argue that sand is going to fill this up, take on its shape, 
And so there are some solids that will act like fluids if they're fine enough, right? I mean, and that's why like sand or dirt or whatever would get in here pretty well is because it's really small, right? It's small and those particles can kind of compact in against each other. Um, but the shape of that sand crystal is the shape of that sand crystal, period. But the shape of the water droplet will change, right? We take one drop of water falling through the air, it's gonna have a teardrop shape. And set it on a glass slide, it's gonna have a little hump shape. Put another glass plate on top of it and it elongates out and becomes more like cylindrical. So fluids will change shapes where solids won't, okay? So when we talk fluids, we're talking not just water, not just liquids, but also gases. Those are fluids as well, and they will do the same thing. Um, so all the stuff that we're talking about equally applies to gases as it does to liquids, with some exceptions, all right? So first things first, let me just get to this. The huge difference between gases and fluids, uh, and uh, sorry, liquids, is in what we call compressibility. And I'll write this on the board in a second. Um, but we talk about fluids being compressible or non-compressible, and it is exactly what it sounds like. A compressible fluid is one that we can take a certain volume and we can actually make that fluid obtain a smaller volume. We can fit it into a smaller volume. So that would be something that's compressible. Something that's non-compressible, you can't do that. You may be able to rearrange it so it takes a different shape, but you can't actually get it into a smaller volume. So non-compressible things are like water, liquids. Liquids in general are non-compressible. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but like uh, think about like a water balloon. So you take a balloon, you fill it with water. And you can kind of squeeze the balloon, right? You can squeeze on it, try to make it smaller but it won't go smaller. You squeeze, you squeeze, you try really hard, you can't really make it go smaller. In fact, what if anything will happen is you'll get a bulge, right? Like next thing you know, a little bulge pops out because it's trying to keep the same volume. But you can compress gases. Uh, here's a great example, get a water bottle. Uh, you know, just a, a plastic water bottle, you know, like a um, crystal geyser bottle or something. When it's filled with water, try to squeeze it. Some of you probably can already kind of envision this in your mind because you've done it. You can't really squeeze it. Now you take that same bottle, but you empty it of the water so that now all that's in there is gas. Put the top back on. Can you squeeze that? Yeah, pretty easy, yeah. right? You can still crunch it down. It, eventually you got to work at it but there's definitely some room where you can squeeze down because it's compressible. So um, that's really the difference uh, in how liquids and gases behave is that liquids are non-compressible and gases are compressible. You, so that, I'm sorry, go ahead, Bradley. Can you compress some liquid mercury? So liquid mercury, um, well, even like liquid water, you can compress a bit. Liquid mercury, you could compress a bit, but not much. No, it's gonna behave very much like water behaves. When you, like if you had like a, uh, a water balloon filled with mercury, so a mercury balloon, uh, don't do this by the way, that would be really, really bad when it breaks. Um, but if you had like a mercury balloon and you try to squeeze it, you would still have issues trying to compress it down. Um, because it's, it's really like how these things are built. So I don't know how well you guys know your chemistry or um, how this stuff works. Let, let me go to the board and kind of give you a pictorial uh, view for what it means to be fluid and then um, liquid versus gas. So when you think about the different states of matter, it's all about how the molecules go together. When we have a solid, a solid is such 
that the molecules are all kind of firmly connected. So I'm going to make just little circles here for my molecules. And you can kind of think of this like Tinker Toys or whatever your favorite connecting toy game is. Right, but these things are going to get connected together. Um, the bonds between them are going to come, are going to be formed by the electrons. Again, you'll learn all about this when you take chemistry or go to modern physics. But it forms a rigid structure where all these things are bound together. So if we tried to move this one, like let's say this molecule right here, we try to push it or pull it, there's going to be a direct push or pull on all the other ones that are connected. And so it's going to want to all move together as one. So that's what makes it so that it's not a fluid, that it won't take up the shape of a container, is that it's bound. Its structure is such that it's like this. Now on the far other side, if we go to gas, gases are such that we've got all these molecules, but they're not bound to each other. They're all free to move. So if this one that I've got in the center kind of moves in this direction, it doesn't necessarily affect the others. It could. If it comes and it slams into the others, um, we can have collisions and, and all that. But they're really free to just kind of move around, helter-skelter, randomly, whatever they want to do. Okay, so th there is no structure to this. And so they can just kind of flip around. There's also a lot of space. There's a lot of space in here. So think about compressibility. We try to push these things together. Okay, well, we can do that. Like this is our before view, but maybe our after view, after we compress them now, we've got three, six, eight, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So let's say that those are our eight, but you'll notice that they now lie in a smaller space because we were able to kind of push them together. So this is the we're taking that empty water bottle and we're squeezing. We're taking all those gas molecules and sticking them closer together. Eventually, they get so close that it's hard for us to compress anymore because we're running out of space. Well, that would continue if we kept pressing. So then fluids, or sorry, liquids, are kind of in the middle, right? So with liquids, there is bonding going on. But those bonds are kind of loose and far apart, and they're not necessarily all bound to each other, right? So we just kind of have bonds like this. And what that allows is more <laughs> fluidity, was the word that came to mind. My brain is trying to do dad jokes even when I'm not. Um, but there's more ability for these things to kind of move around. Like, again, imagine that these are all connected. But I could say rotate this bottom one so that it comes up like that, where all the other pieces stay in the same position. And so I've changed the shape, even though I'm still bound together. And then maybe I can bend this one so that it goes like that, and so on and so um, there's just, there is structure, but there's not nearly the structure that was in the solid, but it also isn't the randomness of the gas. And so that's why liquids tend to be less compressible, because think about these two that are bound. Those two, I cannot change that, that um, bond between them. I can't shorten it. I can't lengthen it. It is what it is. So maybe I can rotate these things, but eventually I'm going to get them rotated in such a way that I can't do anymore. So hopefully that kind of makes sense with why the different states of matter do what they do and why it's liquids and gases that we're going to be talking about when we do fluids. All right. So Fluids, one of the most important things about fluids is their density. So you probably have run into density at some point, but density is all just a mass per unit. It's telling us um, not just how massive something is, 
but how massive it is relative to its size. And when it comes to fluids, we're going to be looking at density per volume because this is going to be three-dimensional. Fluids are always three-dimensional. They can go in any direction. So let's start with density and then work our way towards forces and pressures and all that. So I'm going to go back to the board for a while. So first of all, density. If you're not familiar with this, but you should be, because I think you saw this in calculus, we use the Greek letter rho for density. And rho is one that looks like a P, but I'm going to put a little curvy tail on it. So hopefully you guys are good with that. But this is the Greek letter rho. And density, it's defined as mass per volume. And so for us in metric, we're going to do units of kilograms per cubic meter. And that's the physics measure for density. If you've taken chemistry, you probably have used a different measurement. And you've used grams per cubic centimeter. Um, that tends to be the chemist view. But the physicist view is going to be kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so some examples, some examples of some densities. Um, air. When I say air, this is going to be because um, air's density changes since it's compressible, but this is going to be at kind of a standard. Um, temperature, like room temperature around 20 degrees C um, under a standard atmospheric pressure and all that. Um, it's roughly, it's on the order of 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So think about that. You guys know how big a meter stick is. I got one handy right here. Right? So there's our meter stick. I mean, it doesn't even fit in my screen even diagonally, not quite. So take a cube that big, right? that length times that width times that height. So for those of you that are not really metrically inclined, that's like um, three and a quarter feet. Just go three feet by three feet by three feet. So that much air is going to have a total mass of 1.2 kilograms. It's not very heavy, right? But we already know that air is not very dense. Now, compare that to say water. And when I put water here, this is fresh water. Okay, so just good old fresh water. And again, same kind of story with temperature. You do get some weirdness with temperature and density of water, but um, at room temperature, it's not really that variable. But it is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So think about that same size container of water is going to weigh a thousand kilograms or have a mass of a thousand kilograms. So water is way more dense than air. All right. So then other things like if you go to salt water, you go to seawater, ocean water. Um, it varies a lot depending on where you are, but it's usually on the order of 1,030. So it's a little bit more dense, a little bit heavier, and the same equivalent amount. Um, there are some solids that are even less dense than water. A great example is ice. If you look at ice, Iced is about 920 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, gold, I like to bring up gold because a lot of us have experience with gold. Gold is quite dense. It's actually really heavy for um, per volume. And gold is like 19,000. kilograms per cubic meter. So it's about 19 times the density of water. So oh. um, we got lots of different densities and it really is like you want to figure out the density 
for example, of my ring, okay, my ring is gold. If we were to weigh it, get its mass in kilograms, and then figure out what volume it takes up, we take that mass, we divide by that volume, we should get a number around 19,000. Okay, so that's density. So all fluids have a density, all things have density, but fluid density is gonna be really important going forward. All right, so we go to the density. Yeah, thumbs up. Yes. All right, cool. Oh, and, and these numbers I just threw up at you, the only one that you probably wanna know just off the top of your head is water a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. The rest of them you can always look up, but water tends to be a big one that we use. Okay, now the other thing that's going to be kind of important with fluids is pressure. And for pressure, we're going to use the letter P. And I apologize because I know that we just got done using P for momentum, but this is one of those cases where we have used the same letter for multiple things. Okay, now pressure, it's defined as a force per area. And this should look really familiar. Where have we talked about force per area really recently? Stress, I think. So when we were talking about stress and strain, and it was the stress. So whether we were talking about tensile stress or shear stress or any of those, it was a force per area. And when it comes to fluids, this force, this is a perpendicular force. So if this is our thing that we're exerting pressure on. So if we were to put this in fluid, so we submerge this into water or it's in air or whatever, there's going to be force that's being exerted in all directions by that fluid. And so we call, we call it pressure if we calculate the perpendicular force per area. So like this face that's closest to us, it would be the arrow that's pointing straight in. How much force is being applied by the fluid perpendicularly? And then we divide by the area so that we scale it out. So this is stress. This is definitely stress kind of like uh, we talked about before when we were talking about stress and strain. All right, the units on this, if we look on the units, this is going to be newtons per square meter. But because this is a very common unit, we actually rename this and we call this a Pascal. So in metric, the unit of pressure is the Pascal. And we use capital P lowercase a for Pascals. Okay, so all fluids exert pressure that's measured in Pascals, and it is really just a force per square area. All right, now, in terms of Pascals, there are other units that we use for pressure. And the other big one that we use are what we call atmospheres. And so one atmosphere, this is equivalent to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So 
So what this is, and the reason that we use this, um, an atmosphere is the air pressure, the pressure due to the column of air above you when you're at sea level, at a standard temperature and so on. So when you are actually at sea level, so go down and visit one of your friends at the Bay Area or something, it turns out that the atmosphere is pushing this hard against you. Every square meter of your body, so every square meter of your skin, there's a total of one times 10 to the fifth Newtons pushing on you. That's like really, really high. This is 10,000 Newtons per square meter. So if you were to go out and just mark a square meter on the ground, so you just measure out a meter and then a meter, make your square, the air is pushing down on that with a weight of 10,000 newtons. Can you comprehend that? No, but luckily I live in the mountains. <laughs> yes, um, you are correct, Bradley, that we do not experience that kind of pressure, right? Things are a little bit more laid back up in the mountains. But um, so 10,000 Newtons, that's like a thousand kilograms. So you're starting to get a feel for a thousand kilograms? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, that's over a ton, like our kind of ton. That's over 2,000 pounds. So think about that. This one meter by one meter square that we just marked out at sea level has a pressure. It's, it's like putting a thousand kilograms on top of it. That's crazy. That is crazy. And I want you to think about this. I think you probably have all been to sea level at some point, right? Yeah. Did it feel like you were getting collapsed by all this weight? Uh, I don't think so. Not, not to me. <laughs> yeah, I, me neither. Right. I mean, I, I grew up very close to sea level. I think my house in Washington state was at like 150 feet or maybe 200 feet. So, um, you know, but we don't even notice it, but that's because our body is used to it and our bodies were designed to withstand that kind of pressure. But one atmosphere pressure is no big deal. It doesn't matter to us at all. Now, we can get much greater pressure put on us, as we'll talk about when we go into other fluids. Um, but even at sea level, it's amazing. So the reason why is think about this. On top of you right now, there's some air. right? Like right above my hat, there's some air. And above it is some more air and some more air and some more air. So there's like a column of air on top of me. And it's pretty tall. I mean, you could go, well, yeah, the, the ceiling of your you know, room there cuts it off. Or, okay, well, let me go outside. First of all, I'm not going to feel any different if I go outside, right? Like, it's inconsequential. The roof doesn't really change anything. Um, but I've got this air that goes up for miles, right? I mean, the atmosphere goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. Well, all of that, remember, every cubic meter weighs 1.2 kilograms. And so I go up a meter. Let's go back to that. I've marked out the meter square, one meter by one meter square. That first meter adds roughly 1.2 kilograms. The next meter, another 1.2 kilograms. The next meter, 1.2 kilograms, and so on. Now, it does turn out that it gets less dense as we go up, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but you can see how it adds up real fast. And so getting a pressure of like 10,000 kilograms, yeah, sure. If it was always 1.2 kilograms per uh, cubic meter, um, it would take not even a thousand, uh, it wouldn't even take, let's see, it would take not quite 10 kilometers to fill up that mass, which we got plenty of atmosphere to do that. So even though we don't think about it, the air is heavy and it adds up. Okay, well, 
that's the unit that we use. Atmospheres is kind of a, a little bit older of a unit and you'll still see that around, but the, the good um, SI unit, the good metric unit is Pascals. Okay, so oh, there are also some other ones. There's uh, millibars. You see that like in weather reports when they talk about the air pressure. There's also um, millimeters of mercury. There are a whole bunch of really weird units of um, pressure, but we're going to use Pascal's atmospheres only when we want to deal with these really huge numbers and it might be a little bit easier to talk atmospheres. Okay, so there's pressure. And I know you've seen this because you talked a little bit about it in physics when you calculated forces against the walls of dams and stuff like that. Okay, so what about how does pressure relate to depth and all that good stuff? Well, let's go back to the board. So again, think about we've got this fluid that's on top of us. And it really surrounds us. Right? There's, um, let's even submerge something in water. So let's say we've got a plate here that's submerged in water. And we'll even give it a little thickness. Let's say that it's got a thickness of, say, dy. So that's just a little slab, and it's got a little bit of a thickness to it. Now, there's going to be a pressure pushing on it from the top and a pressure pushing on it from the bottom. And those pressures are going to be slightly different. Why? Why are those pressures going to be slightly different? Because of the depth. Right. Think about the bottom. The bottom's going to have a little bit more pressure than the one on the top because there's a little more thickness. So there's a little bit taller of a column for the pressure at that level. All right, so let's look at that difference in pressures. So we're going to have one of them. It's just going to be the pressure time uh, or let's just call it P. And then the other one's going to be a little bit different. Let's call that one actually P and this one P plus DP. So there's a little more pressure on that side. So now let's go to force. So think about our forces. The forces are the difference in those two, but there's one more force we have to take into account. What force is it, Victor? <laughs> there you go. All right, so it's yeah. gravity. So we also have gravity. So gravity's pulling down on it. So let's set up our sum of forces. So pointing up, We've got this P plus DP, but that's going to be times A, because force is pressure times area, and A is the cross-sectional area. Pointing down, we're going to have P times A, but then we also have gravity pulling us down, and gravity its force is going to be the mass of this times g. And so the mass is going to be its density times its volume, which is going to be a times dy. So a times dy is volume times density gets us mass, but then we have to multiply by g. And that has to add up to zero. Because if we think about this little slab that's sitting in water, it just, like this is a slab of water, let's say, in the water. It's just stationary. It's just doing its thing. All right, well, let's simplify this a little bit. Notice that when I distribute, the P times A is going to cancel. So that's going to go away. So we get 
a times dp minus rho times a times dy times g equals zero. Um, also, the a's are going to cancel. So if I move things over, I get dp equals rho times g times dy. I can divide the dy, so I get dp dy equals rho times g. Well, this will allow me to actually calculate my pressure. Okay. So if I integrate this, so we'll take both sides of this and we integrate, we're going to get pressure is equal to rho times g times y. And yes, technically I need to have my y1 and y2s. But if I want to look at what my difference in pressure is, so the top minus the bottom, that's what I get when I just plug those things in, we find out that that change in pressure from top to bottom so delta P is going to equal rho times G times delta Y. And so kind of an easier way to write it, I'm just going to write it here, is rho times G times H. So the pressure differential between some point in our fluid column to another point in the fluid column is going to be equal to rho times g times times that change in position vertically. So basically what this comes down to is let's say we've got a container of water just for the sake of having something. So here's a good old beaker. Well, it's got water in it. And that water, let's say, right here. So there's going to be a pressure at the surface. What that pressure is, I don't really know. I'm just going to call it, say, P naught. So at the surface, we're going to have pressure P naught. So that's our initial pressure. As we go down, we go to some other spot here. Here, the pressure is going to be P naught plus rho g h, where h is how far we've gone down, g is the gravitational constant, and rho is the density of the fluid. All right, so here's how I think about it in terms of that pressure. You can change that pressure in two ways. You can either like if I want to make that pressure greater, I could increase the density or I can increase H, right? I can't really change G. Gravity is gravity. Well, think about it this way. Suppose I were to stack something on your chest. All right, let me, let me go here so you can see my hands maybe a little bit better. So we're going to just, we're, we're lying there on the ground and we're going to start stacking weight on us. Okay. So we can increase the pressure in one of two ways. We could say, let's just set a height of stuff that we're putting on us. Okay. It's going to be this tall. Imagine that this is pillows. So I'm going to put pillows on me so that I have an extra half meter of pillows on my chest. I did increase the pressure. There's more force on me, but not bad. Now, trade out those pillows for bricks. Same height, but now it's bricks. I'm going to feel that way more than I'm going to feel the pillows, right? So what happened there is I changed row. Bricks are more dense than pillows. So I'm going to feel the increased pressure because of increased row. The other way we could do this is, again, let's say I've got bricks, but I've got a stack this tall of bricks on my chest. Instead, I make that this tall. 
if I increase the depth of bricks on top of me, I've increased the force on top of me. Now I haven't changed the density. Bricks are bricks are bricks. But because I've got more of them, I'm feeling more pressure. And that's what that formula is saying. When we have rho g h, you can increase rho with heavier things, and that will increase the pressure. Or you can increase your depth so you have more on top of you. And when we were talking about the air pressure, right, the, the Pascals, the, the 10,000 Newtons per square meter for one atmosphere, um, we have a very dense or a very light thing, but we've got a ton of it, right? A really, really tall column. Like you put pillows on me, I don't really notice. But what if I've got 100 meters of pillows on top of me? I'm going to notice, right? So even if something's not very dense, eventually you get enough of them, you'll feel it. Okay, so calculus brought us there. It's super easy formula though, right? It's just the pressure is equal to P naught plus rho GH. And that P naught is just whatever the surface pressure is. Now, there's kind of a cool law about fluids called Pascal's law. And it is the same Pascal of Pascal's triangle fame, right? Blaise Pascal, the French um, mathematician scientist. So same dude. Um, and he came up with Pascal's law. And Pascal's law says that if you apply a pressure to a fluid, then every piece in that fluid is going to feel the same change in pressure. So let me go to the board and I'll write that up so you can see it in words. But again, Pascal's law. It says basically that every part of a fluid feels the same change in pressure. So come back to this picture here where we've got this tank with water. If I start applying more pressure over here, then every piece inside here is going to feel the same change in the pressure. And it kind of makes sense from our formula, right? Like let's say I just at the top, I increase my P naught. So I'm pushing down harder on the surface. Well, at this depth, that P naught is going to increase, but also at this lower depth at the bottom, everywhere in that column, we're going to see it. So it kind of follows actually from the derivation of pressure. Okay, but this is Pascal's law. Not only is it felt everywhere within the fluid, it's also felt on the container. If I start pushing down on this water with more force, that force is going to be felt on the sides as well. Now, I have a really cool thing to show you. Hopefully, it comes across pretty well on the camera. But it shows you how it's all about the pressure, not the shapes or anything like that, and then it extends everywhere. So I'm going to take this off of the whiteboard for a second. And if we can't see it well against the background that is me, I'll try it with something else, but I think you can see that pretty well. Okay, so what I've got here is a container that has four different columns. You can see this one over here. It's just a nice cylinder, it goes straight on up. The next one, you can see it's got like two bulbs. The third one's just really squiggly. And then the fourth one is a cylinder, but it's fatter. So hopefully you guys can see that pretty well. Um, give me one second here. I'm going to get a better background. That's much better. OK, so you see the four different guys. 
But I want you to notice that all of the fluid levels are exactly the same height. If you were to just run across the top, you can see that all of those are the same height. So it doesn't matter what the shape is. All that matters is the pressure that being exerted. So basically the way to interpret this or to see what's going on is there's air pressure that's pushing down on this big one. There's also air pressure pushing down on the small one on the other side and the other two in the middle. But at each point here, it's the same air pressure. If I were to push down harder, say on this big one, what we would need to see is a increase with the others. They'd have to push upward because of Pascal's law. Now, the reason we don't see that happen is because the pressure is pushing on the other side in the same amount. And so it's kind of balanced out. So it totally doesn't matter the shape. It just matters what pressure is going on. So if I change the pressure in one, it will change the pressures in the others. Now I'm going to see if I can do this. I have a, I have draw. I don't know if you can see it. But I'm going to use a straw. So I blow across the top of one of them. So I'm going to try to blow across the top of the curvy one. And what you should see is level in curvy one should go up. So I'm going to try this. Let's see how this goes. How does that work? All right. So you saw it go up? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of cool, huh? Yes. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Don't look at the curvy one. Look at maybe the one with the bulbs or this one that's far out on the side because you can really see that level pretty well. So watch what happens to that level when I do the same thing. So I'm still going to blow over the top of the curve, but watch the level maybe on this one on the end. Did you see it move? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. What did it do? Went down a little bit. It went down and up a little bit. It yeah. went down a little bit. All right. So what happened? Hold on a second. Let me switch again. I find that when I talk physics, I use my hands a lot. So, um, okay. So I'll get to later why blowing across the top did this. But um, basically what happened was I changed the pressure on top of that curvy one. And in fact, I lowered the pressure, right? So yeah, actually, Caesar, you just put in the uh, chat, you remove some of the pressure on the one you're blowing on. That's exactly right. By blowing over the top, I was actually able to change the pressure pushing down on that column. Okay. so. I lower that pressure, that change in pressure is felt over everything else, over all those other columns. So basically, I made it, it was kind of like I was sucking, right? When you suck on a straw, I'm just, I might as well tell you this. When you suck on a straw to like drink a soda or something, you're changing the pressure, you're changing the pressure in your mouth. You're lowering the air pressure in your mouth so that now, think about your straw. You've got low air pressure on one end. You've got higher pressure on this side. The higher pressure wants to push because it's, it's an unbalanced force now. So it's going to take that fluid and push it this way. Well, eventually it pushes so that it comes into your mouth. Like, I bet you've never actually thought about that when you've sucked on a straw. Like, what is it that's actually making that, you know, high quality root beer come into your mouth? Don't drink high quality root beer out of a straw. It makes it all bubbly. It's, no. 
but uh, you know, what is it that actually makes that happen is you're changing the pressure. You're changing the pressure on either end, which unbalances the forces. Good, Ian. Oh, it's just like, that's the same process of how we get air into our mouths. It's like by, we increase the volume, right? Where we like our diaphragm pulls down and then air is able to come in. Yep, exactly. Like when you breathe in, by breathing in, you're changing the pressure, right? So when I go, I've lowered the pressure in my chest, which forces the air into my lungs. So, yep, that's exactly it. It's all about a change in pressure. Okay, so that's Pascal. Pascal's law is saying why we see that transfer in pressure from one place to another. And we actually use this all the time. Um, you know, the straw example is a good one. Um, but another good example is like a um, hydraulic press. I don't know if anybody's ever worked in a garage or something that has a hydraulic press, but um, a hydraulic press is basically a way to lift really heavy objects by applying a small amount of force. Um, it, you know, a lot of jacks work like this to help, you know, um, raise up cars. Or if you've ever been to a garage and you've seen those lifts that like literally take the car and lift it up so that people can get underneath and work on them. Um, it's making use of this principle. Let me draw you another picture. First, let me move this so I don't spill the blue water all over. I don't think uh, my son would be very happy if when he came home next time he saw this big old blue spot on his carpet. Hey, it's my carpet. I own this house. All right. So here's what's going on with like a hydraulic press. So we're going to have, say, a little small cylinder here that's in some sort of a fluid that then's connected to a bigger one. And so inside of this is some sort of a fluid. We tend to use some sort of an oil or something like that in the hydraulic press, but that's going to be some kind of a fluid. Okay, so we already know that if there's a change in pressure here on the small one, there's gonna be a corresponding change in pressure on the big one. So remember what pressure is, it's force per area. So if we look at this side, this pressure, we'll call it F1 over A1, where A1 is that area right there. And then on the other side, this pressure is equal to force two, over area two. And so area two is the area of this other big one. So from Pascal's law, we know that those pressures are equal. So we get F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. And let me just solve this for F2. So we get F2, that's equal to A2 over A1 times F1. So force one, that's gonna be the force that I apply. Okay, so this is gonna be me pushing down on this thing to try to lift a car or something like that. And then A2 over A1, that's the ratio of the two areas. And so in this design, you can see that A2 is bigger than A1. So that means that this multiple is bigger than one. So the force that's being felt, the lifting force on A2 is gonna be bigger than the force I'm pushing down with F1. And I can make it significantly bigger if I change that area so that this ratio is large. So let's say that the area of this bigger one is 10 times the smaller. I'm gonna get 10 times the force that I apply. So if I apply 10 Newtons, I'm actually getting 100 Newton force over here. 
So you can see why this allows us to lift really heavy objects by applying a small force. It's, we're, we're taking advantage of the physics in order to do this in a faster, easier way. Anyway, so that's Pascal's law, and it's a biggie. It really defines what happens when um, you've got a, when you've got some sort of a fluid in a container, you can actually change the force on one side and make it apply everywhere else. All right, so now that we saw that one, let me give you another principle. That's kind of a biggie. And this one is Archimedes principle. So I don't know if you've heard of Archimedes. You should have. Um, he's in my top three mathematicians of all time. Like if you're gonna go back in history and talk about the best of the best, he's in the top three easy. Um, he's gonna be up there with Newton. And then uh, after Newton, Newton, Archimedes, and probably Gauss would be my favorite. Um, real quick, Victor, you just said, does the Panama Canal work like that? No. Panama Canal um, actually makes use of Archimedes principle. So I'll, I'll answer that one here in a second. So just hold tight to how the Panama Canal does its thing. Okay, so Archimedes principle. Um, Archimedes was a Greek mathematician scientist. Um, he's the one who came up with the idea of the uh, reflective death ray. Um, Mythbuster did a great uh, thing on that. Um, but he had all kinds of great ideas. And mathematically, he did, he actually was approaching calculus. He just didn't quite have the tools yet. So, but anyway, so Archimedes principle. And so, what this says is that an object that's in a fluid. feels an upward force equivalent to the mass of the displaced fluid. And actually, I need to change one word here. It's not the mass, it's the weight. Because a force can't equal a mass, but it can equal a weight. All right, so this is what this means. So here again is our container of a fluid. And let's say that we've got an object that's in it. So to make life easy again, we'll just go with like a little block. So that block has a volume. And whatever its volume is, that's how much water is no longer there, right? That block has moved that much water out of the way. And what Archimedes principle says is that if you take the weight of the water, that's been displaced. That's the amount of force that this is going to feel pushing up. So now when we've got an object that's in a fluid, when I ask you what forces are being applied, Victor's going to give me gravity. And then we should all immediately go to, oh yeah, there's also this force from Archimedes principle. And we call this the buoyant force. So this force that we're talking about that points up, it's buoyancy So we call it the buoyant force. And you have all experienced this, I'm sure because I would bet good money that every single one of you has been in a pool or the ocean 
or maybe a lake, right? We've all been in water before. And you think about it, when you're on the surface of the water, you just float. You don't sink. And if we think about this from the physics perspective, right, go to the balancing of the forces and everything, gravity's pulling us down. We should be going down, but we're not. That means there has to be another force that's balancing us out. That's the buoyant force. Okay, so it's equal in force to the weight of the fluid that you've displaced. So if you want to get a size for this, because it's, it's going to be nice for us to be able to say B is equal to, here's what it's going to be. You need to know the volume that you're displacing. And you're going to multiply it by the density of the fluid. So when I write here, B is equal to rho times V, rho is the density of the fluid. And then V, this is the volume of the object. Or at least the portion of the object that's in the water. Because like in that example of us floating on the surface, not all of your body is underwater. Right? Your head is still above water, some of your stomach, your legs and stuff, they're still above water. But if you look at the part that's actually in the water, you multiply that by the density of the water, and that gives you your buoyant force. So I'm just curious, has anyone ever been in a really salty body of water? Like the ocean or the Great Salt Lake or anything like that? And it's okay if the answer is no, I'm just curious. So Victor's a no. Everybody else is quiet, so I'm guessing that also means no. Okay, well, if you ever get the chance, if you ever get the chance um, and you go to somewhere that's really salty, so like I said, like the ocean, um, the Great Salt Lake in Utah is a good example. Um, getting there's hard, but the Dead Sea yeah. over in... Um, the Middle East, that's like super, super salty. But if you ever get the chance, what I want you to do is, as the ocean's a little bit harder because it's not usually calm, but if you're at a spot in the ocean where it's kind of calm, I want you to just float there. And you'll notice that you float a lot higher up than you do in fresh water. More of your body's gonna be out of the water than in fresh water. And that's because that salt water has a greater density. You may remember that when I wrote up the numbers, uh, fresh water was 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Salt water is 1,030. So it's a, it's a little bit uh, more dense. Well, that extra 30 kilograms per cubic meter is enough to create more newtons of force pushing you upward. So it's actually really hard to like go diving underneath the ocean in salt water. Um, so Victor just put up, he said, you know, if you put an egg in a glass of salt water and another in fresh water is going to float in the salt water. Yeah, that's actually a really good way of seeing it. Thanks for bringing that up because that's something that you guys probably can do just at home. Um, although with how expensive and eggs, uh, hard to get eggs are right now, maybe you don't want to. Um, but if you were to take, and this will work for anything. So if you've got some salt, make a uh, container of just fresh water and another one that's got good salt water. Make sure the salt's all nice mixed in and all that. And then put various objects in them and you'll see that they sometimes will float in the salt water where they won't in the fresh water. And that's because of the fact that the salt water is denser and pushes up with a greater force. So uh, thanks for bringing that up, Victor. Yeah, that's something that you guys can see um, at home. I can probably rig something to show you guys later where that happens as well. Um, but anyway, so this is your buoyant force. It's all dependent upon how much water or fluid you're displacing. Now, 
you notice that when we talk about buoyant forces, I said it's just for fluids. So think about when we were doing those problems of objects falling in the air. Turns out we need to have a buoyant force on those as well. We've never taken it into account once, right? And so you might go, ooh, is that one of the reasons why everything we ever did in the lab was wrong? Uh, it might add to it, but I'm going to show you how significant that is. Um, and you can tell me whether you think it mattered that we took it into account when we were in air. All right. So let's go back to the board and um, let's do that and also just look at gravity versus buoyancy. So let's take an object that's falling in a fluid. And this fluid, it can be water, it can be air, it can be honey, it can be, I, I don't really care. But let's just look at Archimedes' principle with this buoyant force compared to gravity. So we're going to have our object here that's falling. And so we're going to have two forces acting on it. We're going to continue to ignore air resistance. Or in the example of it falling through water, we're going to ignore drag. Definitely not a good assumption if we're in something like water. There's a lot of drag as we're falling, but just run with it for a second. Okay, so we're going to have gravity, and we're also going to have our buoyant force. Okay, so we just saw the buoyant force. The buoyant force, it's going to equal the rho of the fluid. So out here, we're going to have the row of the fluid, times the volume. So whatever the volume of this box is, we're going to multiply that by the density of the fluid that it's in. All right. So then what about gravity? How big of a force is that? Depends on the mass. Okay, it depends on the mass because it's just good old mg, right? So gravity is going to equal mg. So it depends on the mass of our object. Okay, well, the mass of our object, that's going to equal the density of the object times the volume that it takes up. So I'm going to call that rho sub O for the density of our object. So we all good with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then in terms of the balancing of those, the total force, let's go with buoyant pushing up and gravity pushing down then we're going to get rho f times v minus rho naught times v times g. And that's going to equal zero. Uh, oops, I forgot a g on this. Because the mass of the water, or the weight of the water, is its density times gravity. But there should be a g here, too. I apologize. So notice we can factor out the V and the G. Oh, I don't want that to equal zero. This is just the total force. So if I factor that out, I'm going to get rho of the fluid minus rho of the object times V times G. So that's the total force acting on this thing. So it's the difference in the two densities times V times G. And that's going to give us our total force. So if those two densities are equal, this total force is zero and they're balanced. But that should kind of make sense. I've got an object in the fluid that's the same density as the fluid. So it weighs the same as the fluid. So whatever it displaces is equal to its own weight. 
so those things balance. If the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, what's going to happen? It's going to float. It's going to want to go up. Let's talk about it as going up or going down instead of float or sink, because like when we talk about things floating in air or sinking in air, it doesn't really make sense. But, uh, but yes, if it was liquid, it'd be floating. But if the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, it's going to go up because we're going to get a positive net force. But then the other way, if the object has a greater density than the fluid, it's going to drop. Okay, so it all comes down to the difference in those densities. So now let's talk about like a rock or a baseball or something that's falling through the air. So you remember what the density of air was? Uh, 1.2 kg meter cube. Okay, so it was 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So uh, the cr or an acceptable answer there would have been really low. Okay, but no. <laughs> so it's about one kilogram per cubic meter. All right, so what about like a rock? Well, I don't know if you remember, I gave you the number for lead. And let's just go that it's 10,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So think about what we're doing when we look at the buoyant force of air pushing up against the gravitational force pulling on, say, my ring, right, my gold ring. So I'm going to have like 1 minus 10,000. Are you good with ignoring that 1? Yeah, it's really negative yeah I, I hope you're cool with that because i mean we're off by a factor of ten thousand it's inconsequential and then you might go yeah but gold is really dense okay go to water water's density was a thousand one versus a thousand a tenth of a percent I don't care at all so all those times we probably should have technically gone ooh there's also a buoyant force but when we go if we had gone to and calculate it it would have been so small that it would have been many decimal places later and we probably would have just canceled that out anyway and just gone oh well we're going to round to three decimal places and it doesn't matter so with more with new knowledge of this buoyant force i'm assuming that that's related to terminal velocity Actually, no. No? No. So terminal velocity is all about that thing we've been ignoring the whole time. Air Term resistance? Yeah, terminal velocity comes from air resistance and drag. Because as an object falls, there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of friction. I know air seems empty, but there's a lot of stuff here, and it definitely pushes against that object. Um, you've experienced this again, you know, like I talked about, if you're in a car or something, you stick your hand out the window, you feel it, right, getting pushed back. That's air resistance. And it's significant, right? Because when you stick your hand out there, you feel it. Um, if air resistance was actually negligible, we wouldn't feel wind. That's what wind is. I don't know if you know that, but wind is the particles of air moving past you and applying a force on your body and pushing you back, right? So, um, but that's pretty significant. And what happens with terminal velocity is that air resistance, it depends on your speed. The faster you go, the more air resistance there is. And you know this too, like um, think about when you're on a bike or something and you're going slowly, you don't really feel the wind in your face. But if you speed up because you're going down a hill or something, it's really pushing against you. So. The faster you go, the more resistive force there is. So an object that's falling wants to speed up because of gravitational acceleration. So it starts speeding up. As it speeds up, the resistive force increases until eventually that resistive force balances gravity 
and then you don't speed up anymore. So it's similar to this in how there's a force pointing upward, kind of like the buoyant force, but it's caused by something completely different. And the buoyant force is really negligible. Um, where it would apply though, is if we're talking about terminal velocity of something falling in a column of water, right? So like, let's say we go out and you know we're hanging out at the lake and uh, you go to take a picture and you accidentally drop your phone into the water. Okay, well, A, that's the start of a shitty day. But um, <laughs> what you would see is that as it's falling in the water, it's going to fall at a pretty slow rate, at least compared to out in the air. And that's because two things. One, there's the buoyant force, which now is significant. And also drag is more because that fluid water it's, it's thicker than air, it, it impedes your progress. And your object's gonna reach terminal velocity falling in the water much faster than it would in air. And that terminal velocity is gonna be much lower. So um, it, it's not really related to the buoyant force, it's just, it's the air resistance. And um, when you get to differential equations, and Ian can back me up on this, when you get to diffy Qs, you're gonna start learning how to deal with that because we were doing that just the other day. Um, which I think made everybody in that class who's gone through physics feel a lot better because they're like, okay, cool. Now we can actually deal with reality. So um, just for right now, you're going to have to stick with the, yeah, we're not going to do air resistance because it complicates the math too much, but you're not far. You're not very far from being able to deal with it. So anyway. So the buoyant force comes from Archimedes principle, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's a fun story about Archimedes. He's the one, if you've heard this, um, th and this is the story. I don't know how much of this is true. I'm sure just like all these great stories, they get embellished as time goes on. But the story goes that um, the king of, I think he was from Syracuse. So the king of Syracuse um, had sent his crown to get, you know, embellishments or whatever. And it came back. And the king was concerned that the metalsmith had stolen some of the gold and replaced it with uh, something else or left it hollow, you know, but basically made it so that the shape looked the same, but some of the gold was gone. And so he went to Archimedes because Archimedes was a shit. And um, he asked Archimedes, okay, hey, can you tell me if this guy actually took the gold? And of course, if you put it on a scale, you're not gonna necessarily know, like if we've replaced some of that gold with something else, as long as we replace a similar amount of mass, you're not gonna notice on a scale. So, you know, you put it on the scale, it still balances, all right, it seems like we're legit. And so Archimedes couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And so the story goes is he um, goes to take a bath and he set, gets himself in the bathtub and he has that aha moment. And he goes, wait a minute, I just got in the bathtub, all this water splashed out. Uh, it's gotta be an equivalent amount of volumes of the forces, blah, blah, and he kind of comes up with this idea of Archimedes principle. So he jumps out, yells Eureka, right? Which in Greek means I have found it. That's the translation. So he goes Eureka and gets so excited. He goes and he runs to the king to tell him um, without remembering to put on clothes. So if he's running through town naked, yelling, I found it, I found it, to go to the king. So you can just imagine you're one of the people and you're like, oh yeah, good old Archimedes. Dude's crazier, nuttier than a fruitcake. But you know. um, so anyway, Eureka, that's why when you see, you know, things when they're talking about like the, the gold miners and they're like, Eureka, I found it. And fun fact, that's actually the state motto of California. I don't know if you know that. It's Eureka. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the few that's not Latin. Just about uh, all of the states have mottos that are either Latin. Well, the ones that aren't English, I should say, are either Latin or Spanish. And that's one of the few that isn't. So fun fact, fun trivia that is related, but not really. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here. Um, we definitely have more to talk about fluids, but I think this is a good place to pause. So I'm gonna stop the recording.